Hi, Victoria. How are you? Hello, Katarina. Hey everyone, uh, welcome. Um, thank you for coming. Yeah, our guest speaker is coming. She's new to Clubhouse, so, uh, but we still have like around seven minutes. So um, yeah, uh, we will starting soon. So in the meantime, I downloaded the paper and put it on our Google Drive so people can access it freely. And also in the chat, I posted um, the NYU uh, faculty website of Dr. Jasna Bruchit. And um, yeah, in the meantime, feel free to check it out and we will start soon. Thank you.
Okay, our guest speaker said she will be here in two minutes, so um, yeah, and we start on top of the hour. So as I said, in the meantime, feel free to um, look into the resources we shared and uh, we will start soon. Thank you. Hey everyone, we will start in a few minutes. Um, I guess speaker is new to Clubhouse. She is being here any minute now. So um, yeah, feel free to check out the paper and her website on the NYU faculty account and we will start shortly. Thank you for coming, share the room if you think it's interesting. Um, and yeah, how's your so, day, Victoria? Uh, oh, go well, ahead. Good. Yeah, I was just going to tell you something that happened yesterday was I needed bread, and so I went to the market, and the only bread they had was chocolate bread, with pieces of really good chocolate in it. And um, so I had a really good lunch of bread and chocolate, and then I got more chocolate, and I just had it again for breakfast with yogurt and blueberries. Oh my God! And chocolate. That's bread. Perfect. It was the only bread. <laughs> That's my type of lunch. <laughs> I thought of you. I've never seen that happen before. I don't know. And it was only one loaf. I don't know what happened, but it was just waiting there. <laughs> and That's so perfect. Before. And you can't even do a healthy choice. Like this, oh, you it's... didn't have a choice. Oh, it's healthy. It's great. It's chocolate. <laughs> it's it's yeah. all over. You put it in the toaster and then you take it out and your hands are covered with chocolate and it's just great. It's the best. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> yeah, that's a perfect way to to start the day also with warm chocolate. Yeah, if it's dark chocolate, it's even healthier. I think there's magnesium and minerals. Yeah, there. there's more. Although milk chocolate is really what I love because I like the fattiness of it. I never, I don't really feel um, like I've had a chocolate like it's satisfied the urge for chocolate with dark chocolate but it works in the bread especially if you just put a bunch of butter on it then it's there's the fat right there i have to the guest speaker asked me to call her really quick so um, um yeah sure one we will all sorry about that we will start shortly one minute
Hi, Jasna, can you hear me now? I'm inviting you to speak, so you should get um, you should get a notification on top of your screen, a green bar, and then it says accept invite. I hope you can hear us, or um, if you would, um, you can also just um, press on your icon, like on your own profile icon here in the room, and then there should be um, an invitation that you can click on uh, to come to the stage to, to speak. Let me invite you again. Have you tried back channeling? I don't know if, if she oh, called. We were just on the phone. Yeah. Yay. Oh, um, there oh. you are. It worked. Can you? Yes. Yeah, so the to unmute is all the way on the bottom right. There is okay. a little. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. I have that too. Perfect. Okay. It worked. Great. Yay. So. Okay. <laughs> perfect. Okay. So, um, so you can see what I about does the, it go on? Excuse me. Should, Sorry. should I be, should I be going on camera or should I simply speak or how should I? I don't see a button to 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 see anybody. Camera right here. This is audio, so you're fine. Okay. And okay. I wasn't sure um, if you wanted to use a slide because you have to turn them into a link. You know? And um, so I posted the paper, like I put it on our Google Drive account so people have free access to your paper. Perfect. Uh, to check um, our heads, basically, there's a link that people can paper through. I don't know if that's okay with you to-, to That's go. perfect. Okay, perfect, then we can start, so. Yeah, welcome everyone to Science Society and of course a special welcome to you. Yasna, I hope I'm saying your name right. Uh, please correct me if I'm saying is correct. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and um, yeah, before we start, let me give you the audience a short introduction about you. So people get to know you a little bit and then um, Victoria here, she usually asks a few general interview questions if that's okay with you and then it would be um time for you like the stage is yours for you to talk um about your research and then we can we can take questions or we can take questions during the talk that's really up to you okay that sounds great uh so did you want me to start or will you start uh, or how, how do you want to play it from yeah there? I'll, uh, so, uh, Dr. Jasna Brucic, she is a professor of physics at NYU. She did her master um, at the Imperial College London, and then she did her PhD at Cambridge University in physics. And um, she is, her research is um, in experimental physics and single molecular force spectroscopy and um, mechanics of proteins, uh, how proteins fold under different um, environmental uh, factors and, um, um, and different um, modeling of uh, proteins, um, gem matter and stress transmission and emulsions. And she won um, the NSF Korea Award uh, for microstructure of gem partic particulate matter in 2010. And she um, was a Boros Welcome Fund Cassie Award Fellow. And um, yeah, she as a student, she was a, stu a student from the NYU CCNY Ryu for Science and Engineering of Soft Materials and Interfaces. So it's such an honor having you here um, thank you for coming and going through the trouble to make the content for everything. We really appreciate it. And uh, Victoria, the stage is yours for asking some interview questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Katarina and Yasna. We're so happy to have you here. 
And we look forward to learning about your research. And we'd also like to hear a bit about you, maybe to help deepen our understanding of your focus and your process. So my question is, somewhere along our lives, we develop affinities and interests. And it would be nice to hear about when you felt drawn toward an interest in science. And maybe you can do a quick memory scan of your life and try to find that that moment or experience that drew you into science and share that with us. And if you, uh, you uh, found your mic, okay, great. <laughs> oh, no, I think just uh, muted. Uh, you muted. If, um, mm. So. Oh, I thought that I had figured this out. Well, you but, had. Uh, so what we do is oh. when, when we are each speaking, then we unmute. And when someone else is speaking, then we mute. That way we don't oh. pick up a lot of, uh, you know, ambient sounds. So as okay. soon as you're finished speaking, um, yeah. So now I will mute and, and it's your turn. <laughs> the okay. mic is first. Thank you so much. All right. So thank you for inviting me. I'm very glad to hear, to be here to present you the work as well. And uh, second of all, I wanted to say that, I don't know if I was muted at that time, but I said we're starting deep. The first question is going uh, far uh, into the history and and uh, actually I think I might be one of the few people in the sciences who did not feel like a scientist until very late in my career even. And I always thought that uh, I would do something other than science uh, in my life and I kind of resisted science for as long as I could because my parents were scientists and uh, I wanted to do something else. I thought, oh, maybe I'll be a film director or I'll, I'll do something really daring and uh, let's say uh, something that would reveal some uniqueness about myself rather than uh, some general truths about how things work and mysteries of the universe that 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 I felt would be something that people who don't have courage do that was my perception at that when I was small and, and young but somehow the stars aligned in a way that uh, you know you do what you're good at and I liked my chemistry teacher and I thought, oh, I'll do the broadest possible A-level so that I keep my options open as late as possible. Oh, I got accepted at Imperial. I should probably do chemistry because I kind of like that, but not for any passion. And then I got a first class honors in chemistry. So things were obviously going well. And I did my master's in Paris. So I learned French and I thought, oh, a career in science isn't bad. You get to travel, you get people to pay you to be there. But I wasn't really into it. And and um, when I finished my undergraduate degree, I moved to Cambridge for a PhD in the Cavendish in the physics department. And I was still in that kind of rebellious mode, like I just need to get this done and then my life will actually start. And I was just at the point of quitting, maybe a year into my thesis, uh, thinking, you know, why I happen to have a, a PhD that was related to the food sciences. So it's a little bit related to what I'll talk about. So emulsions and how do you use emulsions in, in freezing ice cream so that you know how ice cream, you, you're not allowed to defrost it and then refreeze it. And there's some structural properties of ice cream that matter there and and um, again that didn't sound profound enough for me and I thought I, sh I should be able to still change course and I was having coffee in the in one of the coffee rooms in the Cavendish called the Edwards room now and this uh, old professor approached me he was a professor emeritus Sir Sam Edwards and he started chatting with me and we started to meet and I was talking to him about my project and and he started saying, you know, physics is actually a fascinating subject where your personality and who you are and how you deal with people and things and, and how you approach questions themselves really matters and it really changes 
the way the research goes and it's not all about being very general and he took me you know I met his wife and and, and him in, in his house one time and took me to his garden he said look there's these all these variety of garden peas and the five different garden varieties of peas have different friction coefficients and different smoothnesses and as a result they pack with different densities when you freeze them in the freezer <laughs> you know? and so we started talking about that and said, oh and actually by the way that's deeply related to Maxwell's counting rules of what is needed for the isostatic condition which is you know when the density of the particles is enough that it can hold its own weight like if you if you have a bunch of grains and you for them, they make a pile that can that can stand up on its own, and and so he it got more and more profound. And he showed me that physics had connections to gardening and opera and people and travel, and that it was really in the last year of my PhD that I really got the hook, and 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 I started to like the questions themselves. <laughs> That's an incredible story. And you're a great storyteller, by the way. <laughs> you really carried us along with that with that hidden um, hidden um, answer. And that sounds like that Professor Emer Emeritus was a kind of an angel that showed up in your life, just bringing you back in to science. And and the explanations are it's it's all so fascinating. It's it's really. A, somewhat emotional as well because um you know he was he was really sharing what i would consider um you know the deep love of of understanding and you know and the wonder and curiosity that he shared he's um you know trying to reveal that to you as well and and you it took <laughs> so what a great story thank you and so can you um, bring us from that point, you know, in his garden with his peas and friction coefficients, which is just, it's just so, such um, beautiful imagery too that you shared, really, thank you so much. Um, can you bring us to the point that you are at now with your research that you're about to share, maybe some um, events along the way? Sure. Um, yeah, he was definitely just to give him total credit, you know, Sam Edwards, he was knighted by the Queen and he was the scientific advisor to Maggie Thatcher once upon a time. That's one of his worst traits is that he was a bit of a Maggie admirer, but, you know, can't be perfect. In any case, he, um, he, he really did uh, bring that kind of broadband curiosity to, uh, to the table. Uh, uh, in physics, in my particular physics research project, and linking, you know, that's fast forwarding 20 years. Uh, the things are not that much different uh, 20 years later. So uh, I don't have a garden though, but uh, we've been looking at how uh, these particles, which could be peas, but they can also be oil droplets uh, in water, which is the case of the emulsions uh, that we work on right now. But, you know, they have a smoothness factor because they're actually frictionless. And because they're frictionless, that means that they can freely, they're very slippery. And so they can freely rearrange with respect to each other, even when they're binding. So they make a wonderful model of atoms or uh, mole molecular bonds because uh, thermal energy is enough to actually cause the rearrangements of these droplets in the same way that amino acids can rearrange with respect to each other to form protein structures. And so we use this kind of analogy of, it's called a beads on a string model, which is oil droplets in water on a string model in, in the lab in my group, um, as a model for a polypeptide chain uh, at the molecular level. So, so it's basically like a chain of particles uh, that's a thousand times bigger than the atomic, than the molecular scale, and uh, so micron sized. And basically, we try to figure out with a toy model if we can contribute to the question how do proteins fold? And um, 
So basically, like Katerina was saying, there was an interlude in those 20 years where I did single molecule force spectroscopy of real biological proteins. I don't do that anymore. My group doesn't do that anymore, uh, in which we were pulling proteins and letting them refold and trying to interrogate their pathways. Um, and so I collected bits of knowledge from SESAM based on jamming and the principles of packing of particles, including green peas. And then I went into biology to learn about protein folding at Columbia University. That's where I did three years of postdoc. So when I came to start my own lab at NYU, that's already 15 years ago now. I just got my badge, by the way, in the mail. So that's why I know. Um, so 15 years, uh, you know, we've now we've been trying to combine droplet science to uh, protein science, uh, using them as a sort of simplified biomimetic system. And I'll just end with one last thought, which is you all must have heard of this. The, pro the news has been that the protein folding problem is solved because there's uh, deep learning and machine learning with alpha fold that can now basically tell you uh, how your protein will fold uh, based on these algorithms um, that have been developed with, with great success to like angstrom precision or something. And I would argue that even though it can have great predictive power, we, we have very, it's a black box and we have very, very little understanding of the mechanisms that actually evolution has developed in order to be able to have folding as a scheme for proteins. And so what we're trying to do in my group is to unravel those principles behind, for like why? Why, do, why does a string of beads have a unique solution for what it will fold into? Yeah, sure, Katarina. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, everything that you're saying just reminds me of how important it is to have exposure to science because there's never, there's never a reason for boredom because you can, you know, zoom back on a situation or, or look so closely and, and wonder about relationships really at any scale and always have something to wonder about. And, um, which is exactly what I see you doing. And, and so I would like to just completely pass the mic to you and please um, go into your discussion and then people may put questions for you in the room chat that we can share with you. And, um, and also we can have, if you'd like a Q and A following your talk. So thank you so much. Sure. Did you want me to now sort of go through the actual finding would that be would that be a good way forward that would be fantastic and really we leave it up to you to to share your work in the way I, that works best for you so yes that sounds really um yes that sounds great i can make it i can make it uh, approachable by going through the figures of the paper because they really speak the whole truth and nothing but the truth. <laughs> um, if if you all look on the Google Docs and if you go to figure one, basically we make two pots of mayonnaise. Uh, it is mayonnaise because it's oil droplets in water. There's silicon oil uh, in water stabilized by some soap, by some surfactant. And the cool thing about this mayonnaise is that it has uh, an extra ingredient, which is that the blue droplets in one pot have single-stranded DNA with, say, uh, 20 base pairs uh, that are unpaired, that are just a single strand, that, that are floating around on the surface and, and waving about. They're, mo they're fully mobile, so these are liquid-liquid interfaces, so they can just move around by diffusion. And what's fun is that when a blue droplet meets a yellow droplet, the yellow droplet has the complementary single strand of the 20 base pairs. And so when they meet and greet, they bind to make the double helix. And that's what you see in figure 1A. And you see 
the DNA strands in between the blue and the yellow droplet, linking them together to make a dimer. Now, if you put a little bit more DNA on there than that one bond, you can make two bonds per particle, and so you make the chain of blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue, because they're complementary. And so we've basically come up with a way using magnets, and you can ask me details if you want, um, of how to, to how to make chains of these droplets uh, with DNA self-assembly. And the cool thing about them is that if you make those droplets at high temperature, say 70 degrees Celsius, then the chain is intact and they behave like little polymers. You sort of see them in figure 1C. There's a little C of polymers in the bulk solution of emulsions. And as you cool down the temperature from, uh, say, 50 degrees, 70 to 50 to 40 to 30, that's what you see in figure D, um, you can switch on what is in proteins known as secondary interactions. So the interactions that actually fold the chain. And so in this case, what you're seeing is that the blue-blue interaction is switched on first in step one. Then the blue-yellow interaction is switched on in step two. And finally, the yellow-yellow interaction is switched on. So these are three different specific DNA base pairings in which the melting temperature of the DNA, i.e. the strength of the adhesion, uh, is different from one to the other bond. So the blue is strong, blue blue is stronger than the blue yellow, which is stronger than the yellow yellow. And so in doing so, what you see in figure D is that this chain of one, two, three, four, five, six, ten droplets folds perfectly into a crown shape. And the million dollar question that you can ask is, um, how come it decided to make a crown and not one of the other hundred possible geometries? And that's the protein folding problem. How does nature uniquely encode a given geometry or shape uh, given the alphabet of say 20 amino acids? So here we have an alphabet of only two letters, blue and yellow. That means we have only three interactions, the one you see there. And, and yet, it is possible to still encode a unique solution for how these things will fold. So since I've said a lot, and it's the basis of everything that we've done, maybe I'll just mute myself for a second and see if anyone, if, if that's all clear. Yeah, if anyone has questions, feel free to raise your hand or um, to, um, you know, to write in the chat. So if you have any questions so far, thank you. I think you explained it really well. So it doesn't look like that so far there are questions. So thank you. Okay. I was just putting myself back on the Google Drive. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so, so um, the going back to the million dollar question, um, what is the minimal alphabet that you need for the information to be able to encode a given geometry? That's a non-trivial information question. And if you've ever been to IKEA, uh, you probably know how painful and annoying it is to construct furniture using the, uh, you know, instruction leaflets that are given to you when you buy your IKEA bed. And moreover, if you make one of those steps the wrong way, often you'll find it's irreversible and the only thing you do is break the damn thing or take it back to the store. So nature cannot do it that way. There cannot be this specific, unique interactions like the IKEA furniture to build the materials from which we are built. It must have some robustness against mistakes so that things can self-correct. And it must have some ways of actually uh, self-assembling the furniture, well, in this case, miniature, mini IKEA furniture, um, which is, this is done by Brownian dynamics. So all possible interactions allowed by my rules, like blue likes blue or blue likes yellow, 
all possible interactions do eventually happen. And so what you see in figure two is the cutest example of the simplest folding you could possibly have. So this is a seven droplet chain. Only blue likes blue. There are four blues and three yellows. It's an asymmetric chain, obviously, because it's an odd chain. And it, and it folds into this rocket geometry at the bottom uniquely. There is no other possible fold. Whereas a seven of a chain, if everybody liked everybody, has four possible geometries. So it selects one out of the four possible geometries simply with one rule. So even the experiment is super simple. You only need one cooling to one temperature where blue likes blue. And we show these are all confocal images of the real video of the experiment. You start with a chain at the top and you take pictures along the movies of the first bond, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth bond that forms. And once you form five bonds, you find yourself in this rigid state. And what's fun about our experiments is that in theory this wouldn't work because if you get stuck in these uh, in these states called S1 and S2 in figure 2a um, what what you find is that it's a dead end it's a cul-de-sac so there's no way out of these these are called kinetic minima and in in biology they're a problem as well but the truth is that in the experiment, they can do an out-of-plane flip because of three because of excursions in the third dimension. And so they actually get rescued and they make it down to the bottom of the tree into the correct structure. So I chose an example where we got lucky and that works in our favor. There are other examples where they can have an out-of-plane flip and give rise to another geometry and then that would be a loser because we would not get the perfect yield of the structure that we want. So the question is really who are the losers and who are the winners? <laughs> the usual question. And figure 2b shows you what a loser looks like. If I had started with the chain but I put yellow likes yellow first, I'm not going to drive you through the details, but at the bottom of the tree you see that there is the rocket ship at the bottom, but there's also a ladder structure that's likely. And so if you were to do this experiment, or when we do it, we find mixtures of these different shapes. And so you have less control. And if you were in biology, you might not like it because you might get different functionalities and different folds. Um, as you know, misfolding leads to disease, etc., etc. So it's really about there's a theory of protein folding that says that the funnel-like funnel -like landscape channels the protein to a given structure, and we're trying to learn what are the minimal ingredients to make that funnel. So I gave you a winner, I gave you a loser, and maybe I'm going to do a tiny stop again, shall I? Yeah, thank you. Uh, does anyone have questions so far please unflash or like flash your microphone or write in the chat um, if not um yeah nobody okay thank okay. you okay <laughs> i i will do i'll keep doing that though so that i can just a sort of sanity check <laughs> so that i'm not losing anybody um all right, so you can then ask how successful is this method? And so actually what the paper is about is to say you can write down an algorithm, which is a pretty clever algorithm, and it was written by uh, my collaborator, Zorana Zerevcic, who is at the ESPCI, which again, taking us back 20 years, and as you say, everything is connected. Um, is That's where I did my year abroad uh, during my master's uh, all those years ago. And there I was back again last year for my sabbatical away from NYU. And during the sabbatical, Zorana and her PhD student, Maitane, came up with this beautiful algorithm that uh, if you were to enumerate all the possible states, even for chains up to only 20 droplets long, it takes really months of work because the number of possible uh, uh, configurations 
grows exponentially with the length of the chain. So for example, a chain of six only has three rigid solutions. A chain of seven, like I told you, has four. But by the time that you're at with 12 or 13 droplets, there's a thousand uh, rigid configurations that have different shapes already. So the question becomes, this is the curse of dimensionality. Some of you might resonate with that. Uh, and, and the machine learning in biology helps out a lot in the black box fashion that I described. But here what we're trying to do is say, um, if we stick to the realm of small chains where we can enumerate all the possible rigid configurations, then we can also prune these folding trees such that we only look at the subset of the data who, that leads us to the unique solution. So which are the winners? And what you see in figure three is, in figure three B is the, is the winners of the folding trees. So these are the unique solutions and they belong, if you look at the uh, figure three A, there's vertically, uh, uh, something says alternating polymer foldomers and underneath that title, alternating just means A, B, green, blue, green, blue, green, blue, or yellow, blue, yellow, blue, yellow, blue. But if you look underneath, there's three different protocols. There's blue likes blue, then yellow likes yellow. Uh, in the middle column, there's blue likes blue, then yellow likes blue, then yellow likes yellow. These are the horizontal lines. And what you see next to those is all the winners for those given protocols. So the order in which you switch on the interactions, for example, the poodle, which is the one for the n equal nine, for the chain of nine droplets, the poodle is obtained like the, is obtained like the rocket ship with only blue likes blue. But if you look at the crown, which I started with at the beginning of my talk, that one requires the three steps, the blue, the blue likes yellow, and the yellow likes yellow, and you see it at the bottom of that middle column. So I just wanted to emphasize what is the principle of folding that we're doing? Well, we're, we're programming the DNA interactions to optimize the protocol or the sequence of interactions in order to achieve successful folding. Of course, that's not what biology does, but these are the sort of minimal ingredients for our toy model. And to be honest with you, even though it's a nature paper, if you ask, what is your success rate? Well, the yields are pretty good. There are lots of examples where we even have 100% yield. So that's great, no mistakes. But if you ask if there are a thousand structures available, we've only made 12. So that's about a 1%, couple of percent success rate, uh, the way that we've done things. And so very few structures are actually foldable with the language that we've used. And if you look at those 12, they follow something that is known in biology. The, the, the winners are basically the hydrophobic collapse, what you see in figure 3C is that they're either you make a blue core and then you lock in the yellows on the outside, or you kinetically arrest uh, the, the structure and then you make the secondary bonds. Uh, and so we, that, those kind of modalities actually exist in, in, in real proteins in biology. And so we tried to make uh, this 1% success rate into a kind of mechanism for winning. And we then said, let's try to generalize and let's try to ask the question. And this is the most fascinating result, I would say, of the work is that if you look at figure four, if you just add one more letter, so now instead of blue and yellow, you can have blue, yellow, and red particles. And if you randomize the sequence such that you optimize the number of winners that you can have. So this is exactly what biology does through evolution. These are like mutations. So you change the order of the, of the chain, of the, of the amino acids in the chain, or you change the order of droplets in our chains. You can actually see that the number of foldomers, these unique structures, 
out of the thousand, I told you we get 10 or 12 out of a thousand in the light blue with two letters. But if we add ABC, we can make almost all of them. And so we're up to something like 360 different shapes that we can uniquely encode with just three droplet DNA species. And so, so what you can then do, and this is really the, the icing on the cake, is you can take these foldamers and you can stick them together using quaternary interactions would be at the analog in, in, in protein folding. And you can start to do self-assembly in a hierarchical fashion. So you basically start with little strings those strings go into folds. Those folds then make mosaics, or what you can see in figure, four A, uh, figure 4B. Uh, you see ribbons, you see dimers. These are, by the way, space invaders, if you're old enough to, to remember them. Um, there's islands, sort of self-limiting leaf-like structures. So, so you can start to assemble materials that have interesting patterns we're trying to right now figure out how we might be able to make a quasi crystal which might have photonic band gap properties which might be able to you know revolutionize screens and things and so pattern formation that is not limited to crystals but rather to aperiodic things like proteins are that would be super cool in material science because there aren't many ways with which you could build things like if I want to build the Eiffel Tower or a mini IKEA furniture or, or any shape that I want made of particles, I would need to do it like a jigsaw puzzle. Every single particle would need to look different and fit into one specific shape. But if I cheat and if I first self-assemble a chain and I make that chain slippery so that it can rearrange even after it binds, then I can trust statistical mechanics and, and physics to conceptually bring me down the landscape to a desired architecture. And so, so that's, what we're, we're, that's what we've been playing with for the last, oh, I would say a good five years of work. I want to make a little pause again here, I think. Yeah, thank, that's really interesting. Um, interesting how just adding one more flavor basically changes everything, and um, you can make these really cool structures. Um, that's really interesting. So, do you also play around with the temperature there, um, or is that another level of um, complexity that um, is not? like included yet? Yeah, this is an excellent question. So there's a whole slew of things available now. One idea would be just, you know, let's say you take this uh, heptama going to a rocket ship that only used up the blue blue. Well, then you're in luck because now you've got the blue yellow and the yellow yellow, which you can use for, for the hierarchical assembly to make larger things. So that would be the, the simplest way to go to the larger length scales. But you could start to think about really cool stuff. Like you could start to think about CRISPR and uh, doing, uh, you know, you can rewrite the DNA that is on the droplet so that say a blue droplet likes a yellow droplet in order to fold, but maybe then we rewrite the DNA and all of a sudden we make the blue and yellow unbind and the blue preferably bind to a blue. Then you're suddenly having dynamics in that system because they're changing partners or you can start to think about making logic gates uh, from these things and these things would not necessarily require a temperature change they could all be done at the same temperature but using enzymes there's something called the pen toolbox which is you can use enzymes that can cut dna that can grow dna that can um, basically induce like I say, logic gates, you know, uh, C will only bind to B if B is already bound to A, like conditional probabilities like that. So, so in terms of what this uh, toolbox of folding opens, it's pretty nice because I think there'll be other innovation on the level of the 
molecular scale, uh, you know, interruptions and, or disruptions uh, uh, to, to then ask the, the, the deeper question, what do they lead to on the large uh, centimeter length scale? Yeah, that's really interesting. And then can you also change the strength of the connection? So let's say, um, I like, are you playing around basically with how strong the different or the same colors or whatever preference you, you, um, you choose that let's say yellow and yellow is stronger than blue and yellow or something like that? Right, so what what we did so far is definitely they have a hierarchy of strengths. So the higher the melting temperature, the higher the bond strength between the DNAs. And that's why when you cool it down, you basically trigger, you switch on uh, different DNA strands. But there's something cooler that you tap into, and that's called the toehold displacement method. So... If two DNAs are bound together, and if in the bulk solution, in the water, I add some, some free DNA strands, just free-floating DNA, and if that DNA is longer or has stronger binding to the DNA that's already in place between the droplets, it will displace that DNA. It will basically make the two droplets unbind and it will preferably bind to those other droplets. So indeed, exactly what you say, playing around with adhesion strength, how strongly these DNA bind, is the mechanism by which we would um, input a hierarchy in which inter you, know, you can start to think about cool things like encapsulating things. So only fold after you've, you know, encapsulated a virus and now there's no more COVID because you can put a cage around it and then, the, you know, this is in the applied sciences realm. But you could imagine doing some, we call these mayonnaise robots, you know, that would, that would open and close. And of course, you know, that this is some nature papers down the line. This is not tomorrow, but... You know, the, there's at least a vision there of things to try application-wise. Yeah. It's interesting that you're saying that because when I was collaborating with the primate lab or, you know, we had like joint lab meetings and stuff, we imagined to do that one day too, like, because the problem is to put uh, things you wanted to deliver into the brain in a virus you'll trigger like an immune response and and it was not really very favorable to do that in, in primate <coughs> research so you're imagining to encapsulate just on lipids so <laughs> that would have been perfect so all yeah one, that will be really important i think yeah, this is some. This is some somewhere along that line. Uh, by the way, I forgot to say, but these are lipid stabilized uh, droplets in water. So indeed, the things that carry the DNA are lipids, and that's maybe important when it comes to biocompatibility and things like that. But it's been a fun. It's it's been. It's been a long journey to get to a point where we can control droplet interfaces, uh, you know, with a one-to-one -one relationship with what they actually do in practice, you know? Yeah, I imagine. I mean, um, did you want to add, uh, like, did I interrupt your flow? The... No, no, I was just going to say that I wanted to give credit, you know, Angus McMullen was the postdoc who actually made this work, but there's been at least five people along the way who worked on this in various forms, but just couldn't get, you know, we went from regular mayonnaise to dirty mayonnaise to cleaner mayonnaise, and, and, and it, it's been a, a long journey to make mayonnaise that actually can have programmable design because in fact the the know-how is in 
really making sure that these interactions are specific and controlling the specificity uh, through the DNA is is quite a is quite an achievement experimentally and I just I the, the credit really goes to the people in the group and all the know-how in the field of DNA programmability that that really accumulated over the years uh, so that's kind of nice actually we were just interviewed by physics today because you know we're one of the millions of users of click chemistry to actually put these DNAs onto the lipids that are on the droplet surfaces, you know. So that's one thing that made our life a lot easier along the way. Yeah, thank you so much. This is really impressive. And then you said that you mentioned in between that you also imagined that this would be really useful in technology, like different screens and so on. Do you want to go on what you imagine uh, for the future, like a little bit more maybe? Thank you. Sure, I can, uh, I can elaborate. I mean, people who work in colloidal self-assembly, the, the solid particles, they, they love colloids because they're on the micron length scale. The micron length scale is uh, the length scale that is comparable to the wavelength of light. That means that you can make materials that have a photonic band gap, like a colloidal diamond is one of the recent uh, discoveries uh, on, on colloidal self-assembly uh, as a crystal. Um, another thing that's very interesting about this micro scale soft materials is that they, as you said, mimic biological tissues length scale and they have very strange viscoelastic properties so like you know how proteins can have allosteri where you poke a protein in one place and it opens in another or, or sort of stress transmission in, in an interesting way so that these kind of materials could be you know similarly used to have strange both optical and viscoelastic mechanical properties and now if you ask me about the downstream user of this type of stuff then I would I would struggle to come up with something like a very specific use but I can tell you generally that they could be interesting for coatings and paints and you know if you if you imagine putting a paint on your wall and all of a sudden instead of just a random collection of colloidal particles which is what you're putting on your wall right now, where the solvent evaporates and, and the colloidal particles deposit at the interface, here you could actually have spontaneously forming patterns on your walls and um, that could lead to interesting screens and so any kind of optoelectronic uh, devices could, could benefit from this type of design. Yeah, that that sounds really cool. You could have, I don't know, like maybe an aquarium without having the actual animals there or something, you know, things like that. Museums with interactive, um, um, ongoing experiments and so on. Yeah, there's a lot <laughs> that this could enable. This is really wonderful. Thank you. And I wanted to ask Dr. Shah, Denise, or anyone in the audience, please uh, ask your questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. That was a wonderful work. I was a little bit late. And my question is about using of your research in a case of the nanovectors programming, uh, as we, we have hoped to using that for the drug delivery and how it can be beneficial. And in the case of the bioavailability, how it might change the result. Can you just repeat the nano word that you use? Nanovectors. Ah, nanovectors. Virus like nanovectors, yes. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, I'll stick to the general statement, which is that we think we will know in the future, and we know already a little bit in the present, how to control uh, the shape that these particles go into from 1D to 2D. Now, 
if you take those 2D sheets, like the rocket ship or the poodle or whatever the crown that I showed you, we've, we already know it's not published. I think there's a supplementary movie in the, in the Nature paper showing that you can fold these sheets into a three-dimensional cluster. And if you go from 1D to 2D to 3D, that 3D structure is then very well defined. That is, it may, you know, in our case, we, we show you can make a, a polytetrahedron uh, by folding one of the sheets that we've made. I think it's the rocket ship. And so now you can ask, okay, you can design the shape of the thing that you're folding your particles into, but what if during the folding, you actually introduce something that fits inside that three-dimensional architecture. And so that could be a nice way that you could, A, encapsulate, say, nanoparticles or viruses or quantum dots or whatever it is that you want to deliver, Del deliverables, I think they're called. Um, and now you've got this pattern of yellow and blue on the outside of this little 3D cluster, and you've got DNA on the outside of it. So really the world's your oyster because you can go and deliver that those particles to specific targets and those specific targets can either be encoded by matching rules with the color pattern of the particles or if you're really sophisticated then uh, we have papers on this you can look them up uh, you can replace dna with cadherin or other proteins that are real cell-cell adhesion molecules, and you can specifically deliver these colloidomers or foldomers to uh, drug delivery targets on the cell. I mean, of course, I say that from a layman perspective. We haven't done anything like that. But the bits that we have done are fully consistent with that idea. And how the, I mean, testing for the short term and long term systematic toxicity might be possible based upon whatever you are saying? I don't think there's anything to worry about. It's like you can put jojoba oil in water with a bit of DNA and some lipids. Like there's no ingredient on there. I mean, again, I don't know what the FDA or other approval requirements are, but in terms of biomimicry you know this stuff is, is is very benign there's no it's all biocompatible materials dna i think is fine and oil and water are fine and lipids regular lipids are probably okay right you you i'm sure you know much more about that than me how about based upon the uh, theoretically and hypothesis that you just mentioned i want i was wondering to know your opinion about it and also, as a, another part that I wanted to ask you is about the emulsifying properties of different protein, because we have a different protein from animal, plant, or any kind of alternative sources. And I was just wondering, did you think about different types of the protein and emulsifying properties? So, so this particular work is related to the idea that you can click on using the click chemistry or actually there's a few other routes um, the protein of interest which you would express from bacteria on the surface of the emulsion simply by dispersing the protein in water with the correct uh, tail and that tail would uh, you know with a histag or you, you know some other marker on the protein would simply click on to the droplet surface. So it's not really about emulsifying the proteins itself. They just, it's really about functionalizing the interface. Um, so that we've tried that. We have successful results with e cadherin with n cadherin with the GFP protein is readily functionalized. I don't think that proteins denature uh, during the process of functionalization. I think that part is, is fairly okay. And what's a specific pH you just had the control on? 
you you have you can choose your buffer solution these are very very robust uh, these are very robust emulsion droplets you can go from neutral ph uh, no problem the the ph the ph ph range you can control as you wish for your reaction thank you you're welcome uh, Dennis, did you have a question? Thanks, Katarina. Hi, Jasna. Thanks for this really interesting work. Uh, one of the questions I had was covered by Dr. Shaw. So there's just one question left, which is what is the most exciting potential application for this technology that you can think of? Um, the most exciting potential application in technology. Hmm. Miniature IKEA furniture <laughs> on the micron. <laughs> on the micron. That self assembles. <laughs> that self assembles. That self assembles. Yeah, like how many marriages have been broken in the lobby of IKEA, or, or at home, uh, over IKEA. So, uh, non self assembly, labor intensive assembly. Yeah, really, I think that uh, spontaneous building of precise circuitry on the micron scale, you know, where parts know where to go, that's the biggest um, potential. But I honestly need other people who are not in the physics department, uh, who, <laughs> who are not worried only about the principles of folding. Uh, to tell me what kind of cool stuff we could build, you know? I think there are lots of cool things and 3D architecture is super interesting, but um, other than the colloidal diamond, which is known to have a photonic band gap and can therefore have very interesting optical properties and can maybe make circuits and stuff like that, uh, I don't have an amazing uh, example of what my poodle can do. Well, I, I agree that the self-assembly part is a really exciting one. I remember, you know, Serena, she's not here. She can be at this time, but she is a biochemist and um, she, um, she gets really excited when um, she can imagine a self-assembly line of different biochemical steps let's say uh, that would be for example one of the huge problem solvers and yeah anything in the future especially on a small scale like this that can self-assemble is uh, I think a huge step forward um, because I think our technology you know is getting smaller and smaller so it will will be um, will be very beneficial for a different industry, the Department of Defense, and so on. So, um, Yeah, I, think I it's couldn't agree more. But I, ha I forgot to uh, mention one, one little thing, which is that these are oils. Uh, so the, the fact that they're oil droplets in water and that we don't use solid particles is really crucial to achieve this folding, because otherwise you end up with kinetic aggregates, no matter what you do, because as soon as these things stick together, they can't unstick and, and, and um, it's actually very complicated to relieve the frustration along the folding pathway. So it's very crucial that we use droplets, but what's also nice is that these oils are readily polymerizable. So all you, if ever you make something you like, whether it's a crown or a poodle or some hierarchical assembly of a mosaic or something, whatever it is, you can shine UV light at it, polymerize the droplets, and you can make that solid uh, post festum. So, so, so there is a route to making rigid. Uh, it doesn't need to remain mayonnaise forever. How quickly can these um, self assemblies or take place? Like, could it be potentially um, a replacement for Kevlar armor? Have you ever considered that scenario? 
I have no idea. I know that comes in somewhere in tennis, uh, <laughs> but uh, I I uh, do know. I tell you time scales. That's a good question. So one micron beads. If you made a chain of twenty beads and if you folded them into something fun. The time scale for the correct folding of that structure is on the order of 10 minutes or so. Uh, if you made these micron size droplets 100 nanometer size droplets, you would of course increase the Brownian motion speed at which they explore the landscape. And so you could get that down to sort of tens of seconds or a minute time scale to get it to fold. So. The actual folding of the individual foldamas is pretty quick. I think you could get it down to be on seconds time scales, and if you could, uh, you know, if you could clean up your sample fast, and we haven't done any of those things, but if you could sort the sample and 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 have only poodles and stuff like that, uh, then you could, you know, leave it overnight and in the morning you could have your material of choice made so i think time is not i think time is reasonable and do you have a trigger built in or planning let's say you have it in something whatever it is and then you maybe need this as like at some t specific time point uh to um start producing and then um, maybe even then solidify so is there a way to put like a trigger signal in basically um yeah i mean you you can always have initiator in there and then you you know shine the uv light and that can trigger things or you can have there's even there's lots of different um innovation in the DNA origami field and stuff like that, which we, we have not employed so far, but which are light activated DNA bonds. So you could, you know, spatially only activate the ones that are under the laser or um, this kind of, yeah, I think it's one of the buzzwords at the NSF to say sort of reconfigurable, um, you know, triggerable materials and things like that. Um, again, I think it's interesting avenues of research, but we have not done them yet, for sure. Yeah, that's, I don't know, I just imagine like wound closure, maybe could be a cream, I don't know, as a salt or so that you always have on and then only when you trigger it, then it kind of turns into a patch or so, you know, I don't know, <laughs> something. That would be really cool and interesting. Or for sports, um, maybe ligaments. If some ligament breaks, you have it injected next to the ligaments and then, you know, it could trigger it and it would, like, help the ligament not break or something. I don't know, some preventive sports medicine. Sounds great. Sounds <laughs> great. I'll be I'll be watching this space as much as you. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very exciting that you kind of create something that then, you know, can then evolve into its thing, right? And being picked up and used a lot, like looking at your baby growing up, I imagine. Well, I actually, now that you mentioned that, you remind me that I forgot the the big, big, big picture, which is that, you know, if we really look in the future, this, you know, you'd like to have materials that evolve and that spontaneously, you know, optimize their function through some way of mutation and, and that self-replicate and that do all kinds of artificial life, uh, life-like functions. And, uh, and uh, if you take the eight professors who are at the NYU uh, Center for Soft Matter, you know, I'm one of them, but we're eight of us. I think collectively, we're all looking at aspects of artificial life on the colloidal length scale to have evolution, adaptation, locomotion, uh, uh, you know, uh, self-evolving uh, uh, 
materials that that are somehow uh, programmable in a way that improves their function and and uh, and if we get anywhere along that way uh, we'll be pleased uh, so, so far it's so far we're at the beginnings of that kind of of those kind of soft machines soft robotics yeah just to give you like we had this room and talked about different articles in that space of self-assembly like including noise and um, other mini robots and and xenobots and all these things so we were imagining that one day we have like buildings that just self-heal and fix themselves and have <laughs> their own immune system so okay we pull we, out that don't belong there <laughs> we we share the same dream we share the same dream so i i should have maybe even started with that that this is the baby steps to try to get to some slime that can think for itself yeah but and you know already slime molds i don't know if you ever um saw this experiment where they kind of gave it the job to map out um, the most efficient way to make an infrastructure for the U.S. and the slime world did a way better job than humans did so far. So <laughs> I'm very hopeful that something else will take over one day. <laughs> well, it's, it's clearly mayonnaise instead of slime. <laughs> I don't yeah yeah it would be better like if we can program it <laughs> but, yeah yeah maybe a collab between the slime mold and the mayo the programmable mayo right right i agree so um i don't um i don't know if anyone else has questions but are you is there some way to do something similar like this with like other materials um but using the same principle basically i know you uh, mentioned to use um you know proteins instead of the dna and so but instead of lipids um to use other materials basically well the the basic ingredients that you need are programmability so who likes who so you can do that with protein-protein interactions. You can do that with DNA. Obviously, DNA is cool because it's very specific and tunable, but proteins are as well, uh, a priori. It's just harder to, to know in advance. Um, you, can, you, you don't need lipids at all. You just need liquid interfaces. So they, you, could, you could stabilize the interfaces with PEG. You could stabilize the interfaces with SDS or BRI or other surfactant molecules. You're not limited to lipids. Um, you could definitely do all of what I talked about with liposomes if you like lipids. So you could make, instead of droplets, you could make water-in-water water liposomes that, that carry the same sort of DNA on them. That, that would have the same properties as as what I just talked about. I mean, we haven't done it, but at least uh, the model should be the same. Uh, you can do this on, um, uh, uh, obviously, cells like in embryogenesis or things like that. They're a little bit of a mimic of liquid-liquid interfaces that specifically interact to then fold into tissues and things. So we've been trying to look at analogs of how does how embryogenesis uh, particularly mor uh, morphs into a particular shape. We haven't found anything really cool that, uh, that I can tell you, <laughs> but we've been reading the literature. Um, so yeah, so minimal ingredients are just specificity and liquids. That's it. Yeah, um, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I have a lot of very sci-fi fantasies around your work. So, <laughs> but um, yeah, I know you stayed already a little bit over an hour. So I wanted, you know, to let you go back to your exciting work and uh, life. So thank you so much for coming. And um, 
you know, presenting your work um, and thank you. Questions. Yeah, and you, anyone, you're welcome to reach out and talk more. And you know, I'm here for the long run. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, uh, and also that story was so beautiful. Your how you came to becoming a scientist that was also wonderful. So, yeah, come okay. back anytime. You're always invited. Um, I yeah, I really hope you come back one day uh, to share more of your work again and uh yeah it was such a pleasure thank you so much thanks a lot thank you bye everybody yeah thank you so much thank you thank you bye, bye. thanks Can't a lot. To have you back <laughs> thank you everyone for coming bye. and if you like discussions like this we have a room again on thursday um Dar um Sudi Mark, um she's a master she's a phd student she will talk about how spending time in nature decreases amygdala activity and uh, Dr. Tarduno will talk about the origin of the inner core structure of earth and uh, next week we will have more exciting researchers sharing their work so thank you so much and uh, I hope I hear you all back again thank you bye everyone close the room in three two one bye everyone